Chapter 7, Soil Edited and reviewed by Dr. Elaine Ingham A teaspoon of productive soil generally contains between 100 million and 1 billion bacteria. Soil and Water Conservation Society, 2000 Soil is the living skin of the earth. It is the most diverse and life-rich medium on this planet, and all things spring from it and return to it. Soil is created through many physical, biological, and chemical processes. Clay, sand, and silt are commonly seen as the primary components of soil, but organic matter and the soil food web are as vital, if not more critical, for growing food and supporting life than the ratios of the clay to sand to silt, though understanding it all is critical. Oxygen dissolves in rain and oxidizes iron in the rocks and soil. Frozen water and plants expand in the cracks of rocks to force rocks apart. Glaciers grind against rock, turning them into fine mineral powders. Fungi are decomposing rock with acids and organic matter with enzymes. Waves on the beach are slamming microscopic pieces of coral, crystal, and shell against each other, creating even finer sands, perpetually. Any soil from anywhere on Earth can grow plants. The nutrients may not be soluble, but the action of soil life can make them soluble. For decades, we've been measuring only water-soluble forms of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, NPK, without considering how fungi, soil life, and plants work on rocks and soil elements. It was once thought that soil needed to be a near-even mix of clay, sand, and silt to be perfect loam. But Dr. Elaine Ingham has proven otherwise in the field with commercial growers on large-scale acreage in challenging climates like in Nevada with soils of pH 11. Soluble nutrients in the soil are misguiding indicators. All soils have all the micronutrients, trace elements, and macronutrients available in non-soluble form. The mechanism to release these nutrients is the soil biology. Topsoils the refined, most life-rich top layer of soil are being lost at a horrific rate through modern agricultural practices. Those same farmers could be building those soils each year through natural cycles. Herbivores and perennial prairie grasses work together along with their entire ecosystems over hundreds of thousands of years to create the largest carbon sink and deepest soils in the United States only to be washed down the Mississippi River to the detriment of all life downstream. Experts haggle over how many years of topsoil we have left to support agriculture, but they almost all overlook how quickly things can change. The places where soil is being generated naturally, grasslands, lakes, ponds, pastures, and forests, are dwindling. Even most commercial no-till farms require organic matter or compost from off-site. We can instead rebuild the soils the same way they were originally generated, with herbivores and perennial grassland and savanna polycultures. Soil Erosion Whether through soil structure collapse or wind or water erosion, the loss of soils, especially topsoils, threatens the ecology dependent upon it. Though soil is created through erosion, this is not the same thing in this instance. It is the loss of soils rather than the formation of them. Poor agriculture practices like tillage, biocides, and synthetic fertilizers, which are salts, accelerate the natural processes of erosion. Rain and snowmelt can also erode soils without plants or mulch covering them. Earthworks, trees, mycorrhizal fungi, grasses, mulch, and organic matter in the soil are keys to stopping erosion. Soil Food Web Our soils are maintained, built, and nourished through a series of cycles involving many levels of a soil food web. From the smallest bacteria to the earthworm to the tree to the mushroom sprouting, they are all connected and interacting. 
through consumption, reproduction, predation, waste, and movement through the soil. These soil-dwelling organisms cycle the elements of the soil, air and water, changing compounds from one form to another, allowing for new opportunities for other trophic levels to participate at each stage of decomposition and growth. The soil food web is critical to clean air, water, soil, and thus, inherently, clean food and bodies. These organisms process, trap, and transform toxins, biocides, and excess nutrients, as well as build humus and soil structure. Though we rarely look up close, most of the life in a forest or field is below the surface and in the soil. And I'm going to read this quote and then go back to the main body of the text. The soil food web performs the following functions. Cycles nutrients in rocks, sand, silt, clay, organic matter, total nutrient pool into plant available forms, i.e. soluble nutrients that plants can take up. Two, retains nutrients in soil, so leaching losses and erosion do not occur. Three, protects all surfaces of the plants from disease, pests, and parasite attack. If a plant is dying, it is because the proper biology was not present to prevent an attack. 4. Decomposes toxic chemicals that would otherwise kill plants. Converts wastes into plant beneficial materials. 5. And possibly the most important, builds soil structure. It converts dead plant residues into well-structured, well-aggregated organic matter, allowing the free movement of atmospheric gases, water, and roots through the soil. Dr. Elaine Ingham, PhD, Permaculture Magazine, North America, 2016. Only when we use microscopes can we truly be aware of how much life and potential there is in just a gram of soil. Plants, using photosynthesis, produce exudates, mostly sugars and small amounts of protein and carbohydrates, to attract desirable sets of bacteria and fungi. Each root hair can put out a different set of exudates. Exudates can exude from all plant surfaces, but primarily from the roots. Plants feed on the nutrients released by the nematodes, microarthropods, and protozoa, feeding on the bacteria and fungi attracted by the exudates. In fact, for plants to be healthy, all trophic layers need to be active and in balance. Plants also participate in intimate exchanges with fungi and bacteria where they discreetly and directly exchange nutrients. Plants are creating the setting for the foods they need to be available with the kinds of exudates they put out. Dr. Elaine Ingham compares the exudates to cakes and cookies that fungi and bacteria feed on, which attracts higher level soil life and begins a whole series of desirable cycles that feed the plants exactly how they need to be fed, not force fed through water soluble fertilizers. In essence, plants feed themselves when soil life is rich and diverse. The soil food web's activities provide enough nitrogen and carbon to support annual gardens on their own independent of any fertilization. Plants need to be free to develop their own associations for the soil food web to be strong enough to accomplish this feat. Chemical fertilizers prevent the soil food web from functioning properly. Compost teas, in contrast, set the stage for plants to choose their own associations by providing a concentrated solution of soil microbiology. This allows the plant to choose which aspects of the brew to proliferate. In terms of categories, there are at least five trophic levels to the soil food web. The first trophic level includes plants and organic matter which provide all the building blocks and food for the next trophic levels. The second trophic level is populated by decomposers, mutualists, and less desirables like pathogens, parasites, and root feeders, root feeding nematodes, fungi, and bacteria. The third trophic level is one of grazers, predators, and shredders, protozoa, fungal and bacterial feeder nematodes, and shredder arthropods. The fourth trophic level is comprised of higher level predator varieties of nematodes and arthropods. The fifth trophic level is occupied by small animal predators like birds, moles, and voles. All the trophic levels have waste that cycles back to the start of the soil food web's trophic cycle. It all becomes food for plants, fungi, and bacteria again, and all are dependent on the energy from the sun feeding the initial trophic layer. Complexity supports and enriches the soil food web while increasing the numbers of times energy, nutrients, and water are cycled in an ecosystem. Bacteria. Bacteria are single-celled organisms that feed on simple compounds. 
Soil bacteria usually feed on plant exudates or residues and can be found focused around the roots exudates. Decomposing organic matter in high concentrations and miles deep into the surface of the earth where greater diversity exists though overall populations are lower for the most part. Bacteria are found in high concentrations in the deepest oil and natural gas wells ever drilled. Some bacteria are photosynthesizing, creating sugars with sunlight and CO2. But almost all soil bacteria are decomposers with the exception of those bacteria getting their sustenance from plant roots, like rhizobia. Bacteria and fungi are both critical to the breakdown of organic matter and the building of soils. But bacteria are faster at returning to devastated areas than fungi or plants, traveling on the wind and on surfaces of all kinds. They arrive and establish the soil environment necessary for fungi and pioneer species plants to move in. Though there have also been studies showing fungi may be needed for bacteria to establish initially in some areas. They embody the highest amount of nutrients and provide along with fungi the foundation of the soil food web. Bacteria creates glues that hold microaggregates together. These aggregates hold water and nutrients. Soil fungi's hyphal strands as well as fungal glues connect microaggregates to make macroaggregates, creating soil structure and interstitial spaces for water and air. Bacteria fall into four groups, decomposers, mutualists, pathogens, and lithotroph or chemoautotrophs. Most bacteria are decomposers that feed on simple carbon compounds from plant exudates and residues. Mutualists, like nitrogen-fixing bacteria that live in root nodules, form a mutually beneficial relationship with another organism. Pathogens are disease-causing bacteria. The final group, lithotrophs and chemoautotrophs, feeds on specific forms of nitrogen, sulfur, iron, or hydrogen instead of carbon compounds. There are also bacteria that feed on sunlight. They are called photosynthesizing or phototrophic. Fungi. Translators of nutrients, water, and minerals in the soil, fungi also populate our bodies, the air, all plants, and the water and they span in their expression from one-celled yeasts to long chains of cells called hyphae that form fungal bodies called mycelium, to lichens when partnering with algae, and to large structures known as mushrooms. Fungi are amazing. Decomposers of wood lignin, fibrous materials, cellulose, soil humus, and other complex carbon compounds, they eat what bacteria do not. Since these complex carbon compounds don't exist until later in the succession of growth, bacterial action usually dominates at first. Though fungi in different forms are always ever present at all stages of succession, fungal dominance can only come later in succession when forests develop with mature acidic soils. Fungal dominant soils are found predominantly in old growth forests. The highway of mycelium in one cubic centimeter of undisturbed soil spans kilometers, where it acts as a communication network and delivery service for plants. Plants can respond and adapt to environmental changes quickly through this communication network and also transport nutrients between each other, all thanks to these fungal partners. Fungi can also transport nitrogen from other areas of the soil to assist in breaking down complex compounds, like the lignin in wood. This is why many food growers have concerns about using wood chip mulch in their gardens or farms. They fear the wood will temporarily lock up all the nitrogen in the soil as the wood breaks down. But in a mature no-till system, soil mycelium can bring in extra nitrogen, enabling soil life to access nitrogen from the inorganic sources such as soil minerals. Green plants are primarily broken down by bacteria because nitrogen is still present in high enough levels so they don't need to bring in nitrogen to aid in decomposition, as we do in composting. Fungi come in many groups, but for soil and plant concerns, four are of primary interest. Saprophytic fungi, decomposers. Mycorrhizal fungi, the mutualists. Endosymbionts, which are found ubiquitously inside of all plants. And parasitic and pathogenic fungi. These groups complement bacterial roles in the soil and provide all trophic layers of the soil food web with critical components for their own cycles. More on fungi in the next chapter. 
the nitrogen cycle. Weeds thrive in alkaline soils where only nitrate is available. This happens when there is perpetual disturbance as with tillage-based agriculture. This is why modern agriculture always seems to be fighting off an invasion of weeds. Primarily, it is because they destroy the fungal hyphae and set the stage for bacteria to dominate. Adding salt-based fertilizers and biocides makes things worse. They serve as bacterial foods once they begin to break down, further favoring bacteria over fungi. NH4, ammonium, is turned into NO3, nitrate, by these bacteria as they create the glues for soil structure after tilling. NO3 can also be released back into the atmosphere as N2 by denitrifying bacteria, and it can be leached out of the soil through watering or precipitation events. Most plants need a balance of fungal and bacterial elements, ammonium and nitrate, but they can't get that if the soil is bacterial dominant and alkaline. They also can't get access to both forms of nitrogen if the soil is a uniform pH or all acidic. Diverse pH zones are needed for plants to obtain the form of nitrogen they need, when they need it, and in the amount they need. Nitrates feed vegetative growth, while ammonium feeds seed and fruit growth. Remember, above pH 7, the form of nitrogen in the soil is nitrate, but below pH 7, it is ammonium, so soils need a range to give garden plants a full spectrum of choice. They will specialize around each root hair, so we need to give them a wide selection of microbiology to source. Protozoa. Protozoa are single-celled organisms, including ciliates, amoebas, and flagellates. Just like other soil organisms, protozoa move in the water films on the surfaces of soil particles and in aggregates. Protozoa are 5 to 100 times larger than bacteria. Flagellates, amoebas, and ciliates consume bacteria for the most part. Large protozoa will eat smaller protozoa. Some amoebas have an ability to eat through the cell walls of fungal hyphae and thus consume the internal contents of fungal strands. Protozoa are eaten by predatory nematodes, microarthropods, earthworms, and larval stages of many insects. Since the concentrations of nutrients inside both bacteria and fungi are much greater than protozoa require to maintain their own bodies, the excess nutrients, N, P, S, K, iron, etc., are released as soluble forms that plants can take up. The majority of flagellates and amoebas require strictly aerobic conditions in order to thrive and reproduce. Ciliates grow better at reduced concentrations of oxygen because their enzymes can continue to operate at lower oxygen levels than flagellates and amoebas. When oxygen is low and competition from other protozoa is reduced, ciliate populations can reach high levels. Thus, ciliates are considered to be indicators of low oxygen anaerobic conditions. When oxygen drops below 4 micrograms of oxygen per liter, however, no protozoa can survive and they will insist or go dormant in order to survive these conditions. Protozoa, microarthropods, and nematodes act as shredders of organic matter, allowing for more surface area to be accessible to bacteria and fungi to break the organic matter down further. This action feeds the fungi and bacteria and increases their populations. Protozoa and nematodes consume fungi and bacteria and release the nutrients stored in the consumed fungi and bacteria in their waste, which plants feed upon. Nematodes. Nematodes are non-segmented and usually microscopic worms. For a long time, nematodes were given a bad name, but it was primarily because no one knew what their roles were exactly. It was thought that all nematodes were root feeders, while the truth is only some of them are. There are also bacterial and fungal feeder nematodes, as well as predator nematodes, which feed on protozoa and other nematodes. There are even omnivore nematodes. Nematodes regulate the populations of other soil food web participants, mineralize the soils, provide nutrients for the soil food web, and consume pathogenic organisms. The presence of undesirable nematodes indicates soil conditions that are anaerobic. Aerobic compost teas, ripping, and some other aerating action is needed. Microarthropods and arthropods. Microarthropods and arthropods are invertebrates with leg joints that prefer the surface or top 3 inches 7.5 centimeters of soil to live in. 
insects, so bugs, scorpions, millipedes, beetles, ants, crustaceans, swabs, arachnids, and others. They can range from visible and quite large to microscopic. Microarthropods mostly shred materials as protozoa and nematodes do, but are not consumed by predator nematodes, only by larger predator arthropods and animals. They can be classified in four groups. Shredders, herbivores, predators, and fungal feeders. Though most eat other organisms and fungi. Their waste creates soil structure and enhances microbial activities while they regulate populations within the soil food web and keep disease-causing organism populations low. Though it should be noted that several herbivore varieties are considered pests because they feed on plants.